Welcome back to another episode on the channel. Hey, and happy new years, and for the first project of the year, I wanna make something that everybody wants to make for their house, at least they showed a lot of interest on my channel, but we're gonna simplify to have three different ways to make floating shelves, going from beginner, intermediate, to advanced. So if you're first time building, this is a great part to start. Let's get into this project. <laughs> All right, for the first and beginner shelf style, we're gonna have a piece of two by six lumber. This is Douglas fir. We have some hardware here. These are three eighths uh, phalanges, caps, and these are called nipple adapters, which is funny, they call them that. These are three eighths. Now they have them three eighths, a half inch, three quarter inch, and I think one inch as well. You can go thicker, bigger if you want, but I think we wanna keep it slicker, more a little minimalistic, that way you can get away with it. All these supplies here for this one shelf, it's gonna cost us $35. So we're gonna cut this piece of uh, two by six down to our dimensions, which is six feet where we wanna install it, and then we'll go from there. Now, some people might frown about using a two by six or dimensional lumber like this because it's not the prettiest and they always think they have to do, do it like rustic-y because that's the only thing you can. No, we're gonna prove you otherwise. We're gonna make it somewhat of a modern farmhouse-y kind of feel. First thing we gotta do is clean this up. We're just gonna use sandpaper, 80 grit, 120, and then we'll hit it up with 220 grit. Each grit allows for each layer to create the swivel marks and then get rid of them on the next layer up. But before we start sanding, let's round over these edges to make it look far more superior, a little bit more quality. Alright guys, with the new year, there comes new resolutions, and to some, it might be getting control of their personal finances. Do you wish there was an easier way to set up monthly budgets besides spreadsheets going into the new year? Or maybe you struggle with keeping up with the old subscriptions and billing due dates, which I do all the time, and setting set money for the new year's resolution goals? Well, that's where Truebills comes in. Truebill is an all-in-one personal finance app that helps you save money and spend less. It groups all of your accounts, and you can track your earnings and spendings in one place, and create personal budgets. It can also track your subscriptions, cancel unwanted ones, negotiate bills on your behalf, monitor your credit score, and automate your savings. A few of my favorite features from Truebill is their ability to safely and securely scan your unwanted or unused subscriptions and cancel them with just a tap. I can't tell you how many things are out there that I still am paying for. I also love that Truebill can negotiate my bills for me from internet service providers to credit card bills. That's right, credit card bills. I also love that Truebill helps me budget like a boss. It helps you set up visual aids to see your spend to earn ratios and it helps you get notifications in case you're about to go a little bit over the limit and on top of that you can monitor all these by categories whether it's monthly or quarterly or annually. So here's what you're gonna do. Go to truebill.com forward slash Mr. Builder and download it for free or click the link down in the description below. Now let's get back into this video. Let's go. Sanding is done, and in case you didn't notice it, you could still round over edges even if you don't have a router. That's just, you can do it with a sander. It's not a problem at all. We're gonna start staining. This is a semi-transparent. This is a weathered oak. It's one of the trusted colors that Irina likes for me to use on different wood species. It has a little bit of yellow. It has even more gray tones, so it keeps the wood less rustic-y. Um, we're gonna get this thing applied, couple of coats, let it dry, and then we'll start working on our hardware. You do wanna make sure any can of stain you open up, you stir it thoroughly. There's a lot of segment that's at the bottom of the stain that you'll be missing out on the color if you don't get to it. See that right there? Look at that, that's gray paste that didn't get mixed in yet. You always wanna apply stain with the direction of the grain, the way pattern it goes, to have an even application. A lot of times, if you don't do that, it will start blotching up. Stain's looking beautifully. I'm gonna let it dry and let's get working on our hardware. Now the hardware. A lot of the hardware comes galvanized. It's clean, but it still has grease. And the tubes themselves, the metal, it is extremely covered in grease, as you can see right there. A lot of it's just to prevent it from rusting as it's being shipped and delivered. We're gonna take acetone, make sure we take all the grease off so it's nice and bare. Shoot it with some primer, let that dry. You wanna use primer or else the black paint or whatever paint you use will come off uh, extremely fast as if it's being touched. And then we're gonna hit it some flat black paint. And here's where you're gonna get extra brownie points because they don't teach you this in school. 
If you plan ahead, knowing the screws you're gonna be using, screw them all onto a piece of wood, hit them up with primer and paint, therefore when you install them, they're gonna be perfectly matching. When you're spray painting stuff, less is more, especially the first coat has to be the base coat. If it's too wet and you start clunking it all up, it doesn't have time to dry, so therefore it's not as strong. Give it a light coat, let it dry for a minute or two, and then once it's flat again, go back with a heavier coat. All right, I'm gonna let it cure overnight. We'll install it and we'll see how it looks. And there you go. If you're a beginner builder, have no experience building, this is a great place to start. You built your first floating shelf. All right, moving on, the intermediate floating shelf builds. We have one by seven material, sorry, one by six. I have three boards here and a piece of what they call two by two, which really is just inch and a half by inch and a half. This cost me $37 to make or material, so we will start putting this together and we'll take this up to the next notch from the beginner. Here are the dimensions. If you wanna take a quick pause on your screen, you'll be capturing this and you'll be able to follow to make these the exact length that I'm making. They're six foot long, be plenty of wherever you wanna use them. I got for the top and bottom seven inches. That's just the generic one by eight. By 72 inches long, that's all I'm doing is cutting them 72 inches long. And then the sides and the front are the only different dimensions. They're gonna be three inches uh, thick, meaning we're gonna use our table saw to rip it. And then we're gonna have two pieces at six and a half inches and one piece at 72 inches. Let's go. Wait, hold up, hold up. One small mistake I made in terms of measurements. Instead of six and a half inches by three, you're gonna need one and a half by seven. Just two of those, just small mistake. I'm sorry, make a mistake. Let's get back to it. So first up, wood glue, I use Tybond 2. It's like tensile strength of like 3,500 PSI. It's crazy. Nice, good sliver on there. Use the finger as your little brush to spread it all out and make sure everything gets contact. Use your 72 inch by three inches for your front. Line it up and then use brad nails to put it in place. I'm just using this my little spacer here. As what is bent, uh, bowed, bent, whatever you want to call it, I need to clamp it together. Tap the mallet, get it right in place. And now you know why it was only $37 to build this shelf, because this is common wood. It's the cheapest stuff they sell at hardware stores, and a lot of times it's not really straight. So spend a little extra money, get better boards. Seriously, I hope this doesn't intimidate you guys. This is just, I bought bent wood that was not in great condition. So you'll have an easier way working. Just, it was slim pickings. Supply chain, problem everywhere. Um, have this clamped, let it dry. The wood glue's gonna do the rest. We'll start sanding afterwards. The wood glue is done drying. I saved you guys the hassle and I wood filled everything that needs to come in place. I use the wood filler that is this Minwax. I use it all the stuff. And I am ready to hit it with 120 grit to clean everything up smooth and getting ready for stain. We are ready for stain. We're gonna use the exact stain we used on the beginner shelves just to compare and contrast certain types of woods and you'll kind of know which stain you like better on what kind of wood. Again, you wanna apply the stain with the grain, not against the grain. That way you got good even flow and good absorption. The stain's applied really well. We're gonna let it sit for about 30 minutes so it to dry out and then we're gonna install it using this one by one or two by two material blocking. I'll show you how. And there we go, we have our beginner and now we have our intermediate shelves. 
in case you have built something before, this is a great place to continue your skill set. Let's take it up a notch. All right, we did the floating shelves for the beginners. We did a floating shelves for the intermediate, and now we're gonna go pro. We're gonna go advanced skill set. You could totally do it, give it a try. These are just gonna be pristine. I bought a half an inch of maple plywood that is four by eight. It cost me $73, which is absurd. We're gonna start cutting this on the table saw, making all the cuts mitered. So mitered means that every angle is gonna be 45 degree. I'm gonna use this little miter gauge for my table saw. It's gonna help me find the zero. And then we put on the blade and we'll make sure it gets as close to 45 as we can get. I have links on my website where you guys can see all my Amazon affiliate links that you can get little tools and gadget and gizmos that'll help you tackle these projects yourself. The link will be in the description below. As far as dimensions for mitering, it's a little bit of, it's not as strict as you really think. It's just a little complicated until you figure it out. You measure the overall finished dimensions, the tops, the bottoms. You don't have to account for anything to be bud jointed. But the only thing that's different is when you make the cuts, you have to figure out the inside and the outside dimension just to keep yourself rested assured, depending which way the blade is bending. Now, to make it a little bit easier for you, we're using half inch maple ply, therefore the variance is gonna be off for the total dimension by one inch, half inch on each side. So if we're doing three inches this way, we're gonna take off one inch for the inside dimension and that's two inches. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, let's get back on the saw. We're done with the table saw. Now we're gonna move the miters for the ends on the miter saw, funny. Um, we're gonna put it to 45 degrees. We're gonna worry about the outside dimensions. These are finishing dimensions, and then the inner ones will just line up for us. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna flip all of our cuts, where all the cuts are facing the same way, inside or outside. We're gonna flip it on the outside part and tape all the seams together, at least the outside part first. That way we can roll them up, brad nail them in place, and then put the top on top. Again, brad nail, wood glue, the solution here. This is gonna be great. It's a good idea to use a little silicone brush to help spread evenly the wood glue. Did my voice just crack? I think my voice just cracked. I'm so nervous, huh? Tape up the front face as well. It'll help flipping it over and keep things from moving around with that wood glue on it. All right, let's let this puppy about 15 minutes to dry and then we'll start wood fillering and sanding. Wood filler, I use this wood filler. It's solid, especially if you let it cure. Uh, it stains decently and I don't think a lot of them do it well. Some parts we'll use a uh, putty knife and some parts like if there's a small little gap, we could use our fingers and just kind of push it in there. The wood filler is dry on the advanced shelf, including all the crevices where it wasn't so tight. I'm gonna start sanding it with not 80 grit, but only 120 and then 220. I don't wanna sand too much of the plywood veneer, the maple plywood veneer off. So that's a thing to be cautious about. Two things I'll mention about sanding plywood, especially when it's edge band like that or miter on the corners. Decrease your oscillating speed on your sander from six or whatever the maximum number to about half. I put mine about three or four. It really keeps it safe from you to taking off a lot of the veneer off the edges. That's number one. And number two, speaking of edges, instead of using the sander to round over the edges slightly so they're not like razor sharp, use 240 grit or 220, whatever you wanna use, and lightly with your hand roll them over. That way it's a little bit more softer on the hands and you're not gonna take, again, that veneer off. Now, because this is gonna be the advanced version, we're gonna make sure the finish is more advanced as well. So we're gonna wipe off any of the little fine particles of sawdust that's still on there. Once that's off, before we jump into stain, we're gonna use a pre-stain or a wood conditioner. Now, what does it do? It decreases the blotchiness that's on the wood after stain goes on. So here's an example of blotchiness is, it's a lot of these opaque, pasty, uh, uneven finishes with the application of this, usually apply it, let it sit about five, 15 minutes, wipe off the excess, and then start applying your stain within a two hour window. And then it should give us a little bit better finish. You'd be surprised.
All right, let's let her sit. We'll hit her with the stain. Time's up. Let's apply the stain. Time's up. Let's start wiping down. While the stain is drying, we're going to start working on the framing, the support framing of the shelf. We're going to use the same two by two material to use pocket holes, put them all together and attach it to the wall so this can slide over it. For dimensions, I'll need two pieces, the front and back to be 73 quarters. That gives me about a quarter inch of total, total, wiggle, total wiggle room on each side to slide it on. And I'll need five pieces, the supporting brackets down the middle, they're going to be four and a half inches long. And now we're just gonna use a square to make sure nothing is sliding off to the side. Perfectly square. I'm gonna use my two and a half inch screws to secure everything from each side, but I'm also gonna give it some wood glue because I don't trust screws just by himself. Last finishing touch is we're gonna mark out exactly where 16 on center is. Why? Because it's gonna be attached to the studs of the wall. And they're all 16 on center by code and regulation. So we're gonna find all these little red tick marks on our tape measure, make a little marking exactly where 16 on center is. I'm gonna pre-drill my holes and then we'll use these three inch huge lag bolts to secure them to the wall. And there you go, an advanced version of the floating shelf. So when it comes to skill set, if you're ready to go through all these beginner, intermediate to advanced, go for it, learn something, take something, be frustrated and take it to the next project. Hey, that is it for me this week. Thanks so much for watching another one of my videos. It means the world to me. And if you're brand new to the channel and you like videos like this or any home improvement project like the last ones we did, we built beams, faux beams in our master bedroom. Make sure to hit the subscribe button, tap the notification bell that will be alerted every time we put out a video. Connect with me on my social media. All the links will be on the description below as well as the merch section and the Patreon. Also for the channel, the Patreons will re release hour long extended versions of our videos where we keep a lot of stuff in there. They don't make it to the 18 minute videos and hopefully you guys find some encouragement and information that'll be useful to you there. Remember guys, we are not trained professionals. We're just not afraid to try and fail. Courage and sweat, that's our motto here. Tuning out this week, we'll see you guys on the next one. See ya, bye.